Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. We come now in our ongoing study through the book of Psalms to Psalm 15, which is a psalm of David where we read, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at usury. He does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. You know, friends, there's a lot of uh, confusion and discouragement in the church that comes from, uh, I would argue, a failure to understand the relationship between who we are and who we are in Christ. That we can tend to either assume that because in Christ we are uh, judged to be righteous that there's no uh, responsibility to walk uprightly. Or we might think, well, we have this responsibility to walk uprightly, and every time we fail, which would be every time we sin, uh, we must not be able to abide in his tabernacle. We must not be able to dwell in his holy hill. Well, the truth is there are uh, sort of two different ways of talking about this. And the Bible makes this clear. Abraham is called a righteous man. David is called a righteous man. Uh, uh, Joseph is called a righteous man. Uh, So many more are called, oh, Job, of course, is called a righteous man. Noah is called a righteous man. But none of them are perfect. In fact, the Bible says none is perfect. No, not one. Well, what does it mean? Well, it does mean that there's a, a standard of uprightness And this is part of what David is describing here, that the one who does these things may dwell in his tabernacle. Now, it doesn't mean that if you fail on any of these things, if you've ever bit backbitten with your tongue, if you ever uh, did any of the wrongs listed here, that you're outside because we are, in fact, covered in the righteousness of Christ. If we do these things, these wrong things, with uh, no repentance, with no uh, attempt to fight back against them, then we have reason to doubt whether or not we are in Christ. But when we go to him in repentance, we have every reason to be confident that we are, in fact, in Christ, even though we have more than enough to repent for. This psalm reminds me of a a common bit of liturgy in the contemporary evangelical church that I think the vast majority of contemporary evangelicals have little to no understanding of. And that's simply this. When we pray, often, if not all the time, when we conclude our prayers, we say, in Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. What What's that all about? I mean, is that just some sort of flowery Elizabethan way of saying 10-4 over and out, you know, catch it on the flippity-flop? <laughs> no, no, that's not what that is at all. What that is, is a spoken to the living God acknowledgement of our recognition that we could not enter into his tabernacle. We could not come to him on his holy hill. 
apart from being dressed in the righteousness of Christ. It's because our sins have been covered by his blood that we can draw near to him, that we can abide in his presence, that we can live near. And I think it's important for us to remember that so that on the one hand, we don't make the mistake of thinking we're good enough. And on the other hand, we don't let our badness keep us away from him. There's nothing. It's not just losing your salvation. There's nothing that can keep me away from drawing near to my heavenly father. Now, my sins may keep me from making that move. But as I make that move in repentance, he doesn't look at me and say, no, no, no. You're not good enough to get in my lap. You're not good enough to sit at my table. Because I'm in Christ. And he is in me. David did not spend all of his days walking uprightly. He didn't always work righteousness. He not only uh, did evil to his neighbor, he took his neighbor's wife. And yet he is called the friend of God. And yet the very one who redeems us is called the son of David. Friends, let us strive diligently to walk uprightly. Let us look at this list and say, yes, these are the things I need to fight against. These are the things I need to repent for. These are the things I need to uh, seek God's victory over by the power of his spirit. But let us also remember that it is only, there's only one who meets this standard fully and completely. And we are in union with him. I don't always know how it happens. It may be through the magic of uh, graphic design that somehow a, a book catches my eye as I'm wandering the aisles at Barnes & Noble, and that draws me in enough to pick up the book and read the back, and next thing I know, I'm, I'm reading it. Well, today's Curating Your Book Library looks at a book that in many ways I have no I would not have expected to have read. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about its author. I didn't know that it was coming, but it caught my eye and I picked it up and I bought it and I read it. The book is called The Auschwitz Photographer. The Auschwitz Photographer. The subtitle is The Forgotten Story of the World War II Prisoner Who Documented Thousands of of Lost Souls. It is written by Luca Crepa and Maurizio Onus. Again, neither of whom I've ever read before, as far as I know. This is history, but as I've been saying about some other histories that I've been reading, it's written very, very well uh, in terms of just being compelling as a story. Although I'm going to come back to that question in just a little bit, but it was an easy read. It wasn't a heavy read, uh, but it was, it is nonfiction. Uh, it tells the story of a young man who uh, lived in Poland. His father was Polish. His mother was Austrian and uh, he was uh being pulled or at, you know, called to come serve, uh, in the German Nazi, uh, army. And he didn't want to, and he was captured trying to escape to another country and put into Auschwitz. Auschwitz is one of the, uh, very well-known, uh, concentration camps, uh, from that particular era. Well, it happened in God's providence that this photographer, uh, 
his ability as a photographer came to be known to some of the people in the camp and uh, they put him to work as a photographer uh, documenting the people who were coming in and uh, doing favors and for some of the officers there in and eventually he ended up uh, taking the responsibility of doing photographs to document the experiments of Joseph Mengele. Uh, Mengele, if you are not familiar with him, was a uh, evil, evil uh, doctor who conducted experiments on humans uh, among the prisoners there in the camp. Now, when you think of uh, World War II, when you think of the Nazis, when you think of these uh, prison camps, uh, you tend to see that, at least I do, uh, through the lens of the spectacular. And one of the things that uh, sort of shows up, without being boring in the least, but one of the things that shows up in this book is how ordinary life became inside Auschwitz. Yes, there were all sorts of horrors, but the story itself doesn't involve a miraculous escape. It doesn't involve a uh, great victory over a particularly evil guard or anything of that sort. It's the day-to-day -day drudgery life of this photographer. And it yet, despite it not uh, being filled with that sort of mellow drama uh, or adventure style excitement that one might expect, uh, it's still really compelling. It, it, it holds your interest. And in fact, what you see is, what you uh, experience as you read this is, well, what must it have been like for these ordinary people? Uh, the photographer's name by, the name, by the way, is Wilhelm Brasse. And, uh, you know, he is struggling with uh, being in a position of relative comfort uh, because of his skill set. His ability as a photographer uh, has made his life be spared. And how does he manage that when there are people going, literally going into uh, you know, having their dead bodies tossed into crematoriums by the dozens and dozens every single day, every single hour? Uh, but you also watch him trying to toe the line on how to be a help to people who are in greatest danger uh, without himself getting into trouble. Because of his skills, uh, he does things like uh, uh, make enlargements or copies of pictures for officers who uh, sort of bribe him or pay him or thank him uh, with maybe a loaf of bread or something like that, and he finds ways to share it. Uh, with other prisoners. Uh, you see him sort of falling in love with uh, another prisoner who's in also in a relatively powerful position uh, as the prisoner. You do see or, or learn about some of the horrors and what, what Mengele is up to. Uh, and it just it, it reminds me of what I might call the banality of evil. It's just so ordinary. It's just so bland. Uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, Lewis's description in the screw tape letters of, of hell as a kind of uh, low grade backwater bureaucracy. Uh, that's what we're seeing going on at Auschwitz. Now, the, there is, it, it does continue to uh, the liberation of Auschwitz, and that's always a, a happy thing. Uh, but also that is tainted by the, the hardship of everything that, was, that happened there before. Well, I would encourage you to get this. It really is uh, a, a, a wonderful balance of uh, engaging, uh, and I hesitate to use this word, but I'm going to entertaining, uh, but also just very thought-provoking uh, and helpful to wrestle over some key issues in our lives. Check it out. The Auschwitz Photographer, written by Luca Kripa, Maurizio Onis, and translated by Jennifer Higgins. It is the story of Willem Brasa. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast,
podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcscrollj.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.